This is a brief overview on how to use the EKG machine. First, make sure that the power cord is plugged in in the back and into the wall. Even though these machines all have batteries, we need to make sure they're plugged in at all times. If the machine is not on already, push the power button once and the machine will boot up. The first thing to do every time you see a student is to change the patient ID. They'll have their patient ID on their paperwork when they come to your station. The reason this is important is so that we can identify who the EKG belongs to. So for example, let's press 01003, enter, and it'll tell you you're missing other fields. Press enter again. And that brings you to this screen. The next step is to place the stickers onto the patient. Each station is going to have a diagram like this, just in case you forget where to place the stickers. So this tells you where V1 through V6 are. And we'll also have this description for where to put RL, LL, RA, LA. This is what the stickers look like. There's 10 of them. And this is where you're aiming for. And this is where the clip connects. So once the stickers are on the students, we can look for the clips. So they're all labeled. It says V1, V2, V3 and they're all coupled together, so V1 through V3 will be all next to each other, V3, V4 through V6 will be next to each other. They're pretty simple to use, just clip right on the silver part. And the last step is to record and print the EKG itself. To do that, press Auto, and you'll see a waveform go across the screen. If it looks okay, just press Enter, and it will be printed. If not, just press escape and then do it again until you get a good waveform. And that's it. Okay, cool. So now we're going to learn how to, well, really refresh our memories on how to screen for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What you got to know is you got to know about the parasternal long axis of the heart. It's basically you take the transducer and you make the sound stretch out along the long axis of the heart. There's no sagittal view of the heart. It's just you get the heart to stretch out as long as its axis is, and that's the parasternal long axis. And here we see where you put the transducer with the indicator down towards the patient's left elbow. And as long as the indicator is on the left side of the monitor, well, that will bring your um, apex down on the left side of the screen. And so, again, what I usually do is just plop the probe right down on the sternum with the indicator towards the patient's left hip or left elbow. And then on the sternum, I don't expect to see an image. But as I slide off the sternum about a centimeter, I will start to see the parasternal long axis come up. In fact, you can see this is like the sternum here on the CT scan. Here's the uh, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium is down here. The aortic outflow track is coming along here. The descending aorta is down here. And this is all left chest we're looking at uh, over here and uh, with the diaphragm coming along like so. And so basically, um, this is the, the three-chambered uh, view of the heart, LA, LV, RV. That's the idea. You can see the LV there, the LA, and anteriorly, we see the right ventricle and then the aortic outflow tract is seen down there. Now, just another way to think about it, this is what it looks like on ultrasound. This is your left atrium, your left ventricle, left ventricular outflow tract, right ventricle. That's the interventricular septum, and that's really where you're going to be focusing uh, your measurements here when we're screening for this. Here's the interventricular uh, septum seen here. And in this little schematic, just remember the left atrium, left ventricle, aortic outflow tract, and we can see systole and diastole. This being the interventricular septum, not drawn here, is the right ventricle. Just sort of different ways to to send home this concept. Left atrium, left ventricle, aortic outflow tract, right ventricle, parasternal long axis of the heart. The apex is seen over here where we aimed our indicator, assuming that little dot is on this side of the screen. Now, in some ultrasound machines, when you flip it to the cardiac mode, the dot flips over here, and it's a little bit confusing. And so then what you need to do is what's known as a double flip. <laughs> I know, it's weird. But what you do, if you ever see the dot on this side of the screen, instead of aiming the indicator of the probe towards the patient's left hip, guess what? In order to get this image, you got to aim it to the patient's right shoulder, 180 degrees in the opposite direction. But don't get so hung up on that. If you see a heart that looks pretty good in the long axis except it's backwards, just rotate your probe 180 degrees until you see this view with the 
apex of the heart on this side, and the great vessels over here on this side of the screen. You can see this is that interventricular septum there. Once again, the interventricular septum, I'd like to have you look at it in this view, this parasternal long view, because this is where you're going to be dropping your calipers, right along here, measuring the thickness of the interventricular septum. By the way, that's the mitral valve. It comes up and smacks the septum, which is normal. And this is the interventricular septum, the posterior wall, squeezing together quite nicely um, towards one another. This is just a normal-looking parasternal long axis of the heart. Once again, we can see the interventricular septum. Unfortunately, in this heart, though, we don't see the, the mitral valve coming up and hitting the septum, and we don't see the interventricular septum posterior wall squeezing together. So this is an example of poor LV function. Um, but, you know, for our purposes for screening for uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we're really looking at this area right there of the heart. I'm just showing you some anatomy here to kind of hammer home the uh, parasternal long axis. A screening athletes for heart problems, Dr. Barry Ramo reveals how certain tests can save lives. It seems like every week we hear about competitive athletes dying suddenly on the playing field. The question is, should competitive athletes be periodically screened for heart problems before they compete? A recent study published in the British Medical Journal found if athletes were screened before an event, the risk of sudden cardiac arrest could be detected and lives could be saved. In Italy, where all athletes are screened, scientists looked at more than 30,000 athletes who underwent an electrocardiogram and found almost 5% of them had some heart abnormality that could lead to sudden death. According to researchers, a young athlete dies every three days from an undiagnosed heart problem in the U.S. That's because in most cases the problem goes undetected until they compete. The major cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes is a disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Often patients with this problem will have a family history of the disease, there'll be a family history of sudden cardiac death, or they'll have some physical findings on examination. But the best test is an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. So far, we're not doing routine screening of athletes, whether they're professional athletes or whether they're just regular high school athletes, but that might be something in the future to weed out those kids who are at high risk for sudden cardiac death. For Health Beat, I'm Dr. Barry Ramo, KOAT Action 7 News, live this morning. Okay, so what are the symptoms of patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? All kinds of vague symptoms, um, you know, chest pain, dizziness. Sometimes they faint or they syncopize when they're exercising. Um, they can also be in full-blown heart failure. They may have a history of hypertension. They may be hypertensive when you see them. Um, they could have lightheadedness, especially after uh, ac activity or exercise when that septum gets even larger and start to obstruct the outflow track. They may have palpitations or it feels like their heart's doing uh, somersaults in their chest, or they may simply be short of breath. Now, if you diagnose somebody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what can be done to sort of fix it? Well, um, they can actually go in using a catheter and... Um, go right into the interventricular septum and inject ethanol to help um, reduce the thickness of that uh, interventricular septum. And so that's one, one thing that can be done. Uh, there's some other things going on too, but uh, you can see this catheter coming in here and injects the, the ethanol, and that helps to um, reduce that blockage of that um, asymmetrically thickened uh, interventricular septum away from that valve. And so, again, where do we measure? Very simple. We measure right here, the interventricular septum. Now, as this video is cruising along, I can freeze it, and if I was going to drop calipers, I would just drop them right across that septum. So if the axis of the septum is going this way, I would go 90 degrees to that axis and measure it this way here. I would, like, drop one caliper here and then drop another one right there. And, uh, and that's, that's basically all there is to it, and it depends how thick that septum is. With, um, there's something called athlete's heart where somebody who just does a lot of conditioning, their whole heart will be symmetrically thick, sometimes um, up to about 1.5 millimeters. Normally, you'd say somebody's septal thickness is normal up to 1.2 uh, um I'm sorry, 1.2 centimeters or 12 millimeters. But in the athlete, they can get all the way up to 15 or 1.5 centimeters. But after deconditioning for three months, it goes back to normal and it's symmetrically thickened. Now, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, on the other hand, you get to have an interventricular septum that's greater than 1.5 centimeters. 
um, and that septum is asymmetrically thickened compared to the rest of the heart. And you may be able to elucidate some kind of family history of sudden death uh, that nobody found out the reason why going back, um, you know, even a couple generations back. And after three months, stays thickened. Here's the scary thing that can happen. So this is the left atrium, the left ventricle, the aortic outflow tract, right ventricle. This is that asymmetrically thickened interventricular septum. You see the posterior walls back here looks nice and thin, but look how thick that area is there. And then this is something called systolic anterior motion of the anterior leaflet. Remember, that's the anterior septal leaflet. This is the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And during systole, as that heart squeezes, that leaflet is pushed up and actually occludes the outflow tract, the aortic outflow. Now the blood can't get past this anterior septal leaflet to get over here to the aorta. And then the patient has, uh, basically, there's no blood that's going to the brain, and then they syncopize. And it's caused by this, what you're seeing right here. Because this structure here is so asymmetrically thick that it's blocking the outflow of the uh, aortic outflow tract. So you'd want to measure it at its thickest point along here. And I see at the end of systole, it seems to be the thickest to me. So that's the spot that I would, I would measure it at, so I wouldn't miss anything. So just to reiterate this fact, this is the septum here. This is a normal looking heart, but this is the septum here. And you'd be measuring it right along here somewhere, the, thick and the thickness of that septum.